Cormac, thanks so much for spending time with me, allowing us to be here and, and welcoming us into your home so we can have a chat about the world and science. And, and it's, a, it's a real pleasure. Thank you very much for, 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 for doing this. Well, thanks for coming. It, is, it means more to me than you may know to spend time together again. And we're here to talk about science. I don't know if a lot of people know, but I do, because we spent time together, how interested you are in science. I think you once told me that that's what you like to read the most was science. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan. I mean, I think it may be clear from, for the first time in your last book where you actually talk about science, and that may be the first book where you talked about science, I'm not sure, but now this is an origins podcast, and I want to find out, I never asked you, where did your interest in science begin? What, what were, your, were your parents? Were they scientific at all? No, or? no. Where did that interest in science begin? In free in science, it's interesting. Yeah, but how did you get exposed to it? As, as a kid or, or? Well, no, it's around. I mean, I, I, how would anybody not be interested well, in science? Well, I agree. My feeling is once you know that it's out there, how can you not be interested? But you have to know what's out there. Did you read books by scientists when you were a kid? Or did you no, hear it on TV? Not or? when I was a kid, no. So it must have stumbled upon it somehow. <laughs> stumbled upon it somehow. That, that's probably the best answer. I stumbled upon it somehow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then, is, is physics the part of science that you find most interesting, by yeah. the way? Yeah. yeah. I agree. It's the most interesting. <laughs> yeah. And once you stumbled upon it, did you make an effort then to, to read books by scientists? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and uh, did you read all the standards like Gamow, George Gamow, and people like that yeah. when you were younger? Yeah. And Feynman. And Feynman. Course. Yeah, Feynman his, was one, turned me on. I mean, his character of physical law, I think, was the book that yeah. really convinced me. You know what it convinced me of was that science was still alive. It wasn't all done by sort of dead white men 200 years ago, that there was still a lot to learn. Well, that's interesting because Feynman said that we live in a period where we're going to learn all about science, and after, after we're dead, there'd be nothing else to know. And I think that's... Not exactly right. Or on those warm nights at his grandmother's kitchen no, He didn't table. talk to his grandmother. What? He talked at his grandmother's. At, at, gra at his grandmother. Okay, thank you. And um, at his grandmother's kitchen table, he had seen briefly into the deep part of numbers and knew that the world would be forever closed to him. Yeah, because of his sister who did see. Yeah, so I, that really resonated with me because it was like, yeah, you could do it, but somehow the deep part of numbers, yeah. somehow the deep... The, the wealth and depth of mathematics you talk about was something that I couldn't see ahead. I could, I could accept it after learning it, but, but I couldn't see ahead into it. you can't quite get it. Yeah, whereas the physics, I knew where I was going to go. Yeah. And the math, I could take it in, but I didn't know there's something missing to me. And it, yeah. was, it, was, and it was a fascinating experience. I, that word, the way you described it, totally captured my own experience. Ah, and so, okay, and, that's and good. Do you, do you sense that, you can't, that you're limited, your own personal limitations and... In, in, under, in getting into the numbers or not? Well, I don't know. Everybody, everybody's limited. Yeah, I we mean, all. No matter somewhere. how good you are at math or how deeply you pursue it, there's always more there. Yeah, there's always a lot more there. Yeah. In fact, uh, the difference between math and physics, there's so many differences, but the math is all possible worlds, whereas physics is, at least the physics of our world is one of them. Yeah, the math is, is physics is a finite business, and math... We don't know. Math appears to go on forever. We don't know if it does or not. No, there, there, are some, there are some mathematical and physical theories that are absolutely gorgeous and wrong. Exactly, and wrong. And again, I'm jumping all around here because I was going to do this later, but because Murray, uh, we, both of us knew him, and he later on said no, but it was clear when, when he developed the concept of quarks, for him it was a mathematical... It was just a mathematical trick in some ways, right? I mean, he was thinking of it as yeah. a mathematical tool, but the real world really wasn't like that. That's true, and, that, and, and I can show it to you in his paper, but he claimed, he claimed that that wasn't so, that uh, he knew all the time that it was real. But I can show you the paper where he says the exact opposite. Yeah, no, I, that's a sense, and I, somehow I knew that, and yeah, Murray later on claimed various things, but the strangest thing if you're a theoretical physicist, and the hardest thing to really accept is when you come up with some uh, mathematical idea on a piece of paper, the, the realization that nature actually behaves that way is terrifying. 
Well, yeah, when you realize that nature thinks the same way you do, and you've got to stop and think, how is that possible? There's a bunch of times in the new book, I have to say, where you alluded to evolution in a way that's interesting and may represent our differences in the context of evolution and, and the notion of God. And I think one of the characters is asked whether they believe in God. And, and, and someone says, and then he says, I don't know who God is or what he is, but I don't believe all this stuff got here by itself, including me. Maybe everything evolves just like they say it does. But if you sound it to its source, you have to come ultimately to an intention. And I know we've had that discussion. And Let me back up either. That's not me talking. I know. I That's know. A it's a character, character in the book talking. I wanted to ask you. I don't, I know, and I never assume that the character is you. But I wanted to ask you to what extent you totally disagree with that statement. I, I have to plead ignorance. Okay. I'm pretty much a materialist. Oh, I'm, you are? Okay. Yeah. And Well, supposedly evolution is, we evolve so as to understand things which will help us to uh, survive better. But we understand all kinds of things that have nothing to do with our survival. Thanks. Darwin was always puzzled by that. What was that? Darwin. Yeah, yeah. He said, why do we understand this shit? It's not going to do us any good. Yeah, no, exactly. In fact, some people would say, it might be counter, it might be a maladaptation. Sometimes it is. Yeah, and it may be in the context of us being able to destroy ourselves, ultimately a maladaptation. Yeah, well, hard to imagine that we're going to still be here 100,000 years from now. Oh, I agree. I, 100,000 years, what, 100, what about 100 years from now? What do you think? Oh, we have every opportunity of <laughs> destroying ourselves. I think you t much to once told me that for you, science is much more interesting than literature. Yeah. Do you think, in that sense, the results of science silence poetry for a thousand years? Namely, if, the, if we think of human, of the human experience and what, what I mean, there'll be no legacy because we'll be all gone, but, but if we think of the, of, of, of human's contribution to, the, 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 of culture, that science ultimately outshines literature, well, you have to go back to Spengler, and you have to, in spite of, in spite of Spengler being somewhat full of shit, <laughs> he's an interesting guy, and he is. Somebody said you can't really write him off mm -hmm. as a, uh, as a f f fraud because he's too smart. But uh, Spengler understood that science certainly does, and would for some, probably forever. Well, I think that. Uh, I think Spengler's right. We're going to have science after everything else is gone. Interesting. After everything else is gone. Expand on that a little bit for me. Well, uh, poetry. I mean, just people, do people seriously believe we still have poetry? Oh, interesting question. Do you, actually, do you think that maybe our intellects are, are a maladaptation? That the beauty that it's led to, that's led to art, literature, science, was a maladaptation ultimately, or just a... I don't know. We don't know how long that stuff's going to be around. Maybe yeah. not long. Yeah, well, I think it'll be... But I, we both agree it'll be a lot around longer than maybe... than poetry, maybe. But now I want to get to quantum mechanics, because you, you talk about it in an interesting way. You know, because quantum mechanics has spawned all of this philosophy that drives me nuts. This I philosophy know. of quantum I know. mechanics. It's pretty bad. In fact, you say... I love the way you say Kant's view of quantum mechanics, because, of course... Kant was a lot before quantum mechanics. We say his view is a quote is that which is not adapted to our powers of cognition, which is which is really true. That's a quote from Kant. Is it, but not about quantum mechanics. No, yeah. well, <laughs> <laughs> about quantum mechanics to come. Yeah, quantum mechanics kind of anticipated it. I mean, there are philosophers of quantum mechanics, and I'm sure they're doing good work. Mm. But well, what, what they <laughs> maybe okay, you're not so sure. Uh. But what I'm but but my point is, and they get offended when I say physicists. It doesn't matter to physicists. They don't even they don't read it. No, of course not. And 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 that's a true statement, whether or not it means we're philistines or not. And you say um, David went to Einstein's office one day to explain to him uh, to Einstein why Einstein's objections to quantum mm. mechanics were Bird wrong. said when he came out, he lost his faith. Yeah, he lost his faith. Is that true? And you want to explain that to me? I was fascinated. Is that a true story that you heard? Of course, everything I tell is true. I well, except make, for the things that I don't aren't. make things up. <laughs> except for the things that you do. No, no. <laughs> 
Well, what did he mean by what do you mean he lost faith? He lost his faith in what? In quantum mechanics? Well, yeah, because Einstein didn't believe in it. Yeah, so Einstein convinced him. He went in there and spent an hour and a half talking to Einstein. When he came out, he'd just written a fat, fat book about you say quantum that. mechanics. When he came out, he didn't believe in it either. Yeah, and then he, you say he spent the rest of his life trying to find a classical description of the fifth of theory, which, of course, is a lot of people have, mi have been yeah. misplaced. Yeah. And you say, but above all, and lastly, the world does not know that you were here. Yeah. And that, I, that's a one, of course, again, another wonderful phrase, but it's also a true phrase. <laughs> it is, but most people don't feel that way. They feel that somehow or other their, their existence on the planet is, uh, somebody has to know I'm here besides me. Yeah, the, the world, we talked about, you know, I talked to you about my experience of touching that rock in Greenland, how I've been waiting for 8, 1, 8 billion yeah. years for me to touch it. Yeah. But it really wasn't, of course. But the, 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 the realization the world does not know you're here, for some people, is incredibly terrifying. And for some people, it's incredibly depressing. And for others, I suspect, like both me and you, it's exhilarating. Yeah, it's okay. And you, you'll buy that. There's no divine plan for your being here. Uh, no, I'm not a big believer in divine plans. Okay. Well, look, I think, I think the, the willingness to accept that the world does not know we're here and it doesn't revolve around us and that if we're lucky, we get to experience the world and learn about it by looking outward is the key to science and the key to good literature because literature, like yours, opens another kind of world for us to experience. I can experience the world through your imagination. And so it, there's this real tie between the two. So the world may not care or know that you're here, but I do. And <laughs> my life has been enriched by knowing you personally and being able to read you. And, and I'm the luckiest person in the world to not just be able to read you, you, but to talk to you about it. And not more than that, for you to agree to talk to me about it and trust me. So I, I want to thank you so much for spending oh, well, time with me. You're welcome. Thank you. It's been a joy, as always, and a privilege. And I, 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 I'm so lucky that others will get to hear it, too. Thanks again, Omek. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose goal is to enrich your perspective of your place in the cosmos by providing access to the people who are driving the future of society in the 21st century and to the ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world. To learn more, please visit originsprojectfoundation.org.